All right, we're back. This is math 200. We're looking at review on chapter two and three for the first test. And we're on um, page three of the review. So it's gonna be page three, four, and maybe even five. We'll see how quick it goes. All right, so number 10. Solve three times the absolute value of x plus one, which is greater than or equal to negative nine. So what we're gonna do is first divide both sides by three, and that isolates the absolute value. So that's always the first stage, is we get the absolute value all by itself. Uh, we do not flip-flop that sign. It's a negative divided by a positive. You only flip-flop the sign if you're dividing both sides by negative. So that stays greater than or equal to, and then negative three. Now, when we have an absolute value with a greater than sign, that's an or problem. If it's an absolute value with a less than sign, then that would be an and problem. So this is an or problem, which means we break it into two different problems x plus 1 is greater than or equal to negative 3, or x plus 1 is less than or equal to positive 3. So you change the sign and the sign of the number and the inequality sign reverses on the second write-up. On the first write-up, you write it exactly as it is with basically no changes other than no absolute value. All right, now we solve it. x is greater than or equal to negative 4 or x is less than or equal to 2. And so if we look at the graph of this one, we do this one here, I'll do in um, black, that is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, right there, negative 4, and it's going to the right. And then the other one is a bracket going to the left. So now, had this have been an and problem instead of an or problem, I'm going to turn that off. That's, it would have just been their overlap, just what they had in common. But because it's an or, it's combined. So it's their overlap and everything there and everything there. So this ends up being a picture of all real numbers, or negative infinity to infinity with parentheses on it. That's interval notation. That's what they wanted. So interval notation would be negative infinity to positive. All real numbers. So no matter what you put in this, it's going to work out to be correct. Now, if you, if you go back and look at the original problem, think about it. Whether I put in a positive number, a negative number, a zero, anything, I'm going to take it. It's going to be the absolute value, so it's going to be a non-negative number, and then um, zero or a positive, and then it's greater than negative nine. Well, yeah, there's no way it could be we could find a, put a, something you enter in here that would be less than, you know, or less than negative uh, nine. So it's always going to be greater than a negative number, period. So ne whether this is negative one, nine or negative one or negative two or negative three, the absolute value like this set up as a greater than or greater than or equal to, it was always going to be all real numbers. All right. Let's take a look at 11. Uh, solve. So that one's a lot easier. So these are randomized, and that's what they'll be on the test in a random order. So it isn't like it goes to the easy ones and then to the hard ones and then the last three are the hardest. It's just they're all over the place. So this is a relatively simple problem. It's just solve the equation. So we're going to get all the variables over to one side. I'm going to move the C's over to the left. So we have uh, negative 1c minus 17 equals negative 2. And then I'm going to move the numbers over to the right. So we have negative 1c is equal to 15. And then I'm going to divide by negative 1. And then c is equal to negative 15. And there's our answer. All right, uh, let's look at number 12. That's a little tougher. It's um, same as this, 
There's just a few more front steps on it. So we got um, negative one fifth times six Q plus two equals two times negative four Q plus seven. Okay, so that's interesting. So that's going to be um, distributive property. Oh, uh, I see. And there's a fraction involved here. So it's negative 6 over 5Q plus. Remember when you multiply fractions, it's numerator times numerator, denominator times denominator, negative 2 fifths. So a negative times a positive is a negative. Okay, so we have ugh, fractions. Now here's the deal. When we have an equation, which we have here, we do not have to work with fractions, ever. And so what we do is we find the common denominator, which between 5 and 5 and 1 and 1, because remember those are over 1, is 5. So the LCD is 5. So then I multiply every term by the LCD. So that times five, that times five, that times five, that times five, all right? But I'm not really gonna multiply these. It's negative 30 over five, but that just works out. If you take negative 30 and divide it by five, you get negative six. So it's easier to think of it as canceling. Like this is multiplied by five, that's divided by five, and they just wipe each other out. Instead of thinking of it as negative 10 divided by five, that's negative two. It's easier to think, just cancel the fives. If you want to go plus negative two, that's fine instead of minus two. Mathematicians are lazy, so we don't like writing extra numbers if we don't have to. All right, so negative 40 cubed plus 70. Now look, 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 this looked really awful here. We had to do the distributive property, we had a fraction in there. One, two little simplifying steps later, and now this problem is exactly the same as that problem. It's just um, a little bit bigger numbers. So we'll add 40Q to each side. That gives me 34Q minus 2 is equal to 70. We'll add seven or 2 to both sides, 2. 34Q equals 72. And then um, I don't want 34Q, I just want 1Q. So we're going to divide both sides by 34. Uh, close, but no cigar. We don't, um, we don't get to, uh, it doesn't divide evenly, but we can reduce it. So we'll reduce it. We'll leave it improper, but reduce. So they're both even. So 2 definitely goes into both of them. And... I think that's going to be our answer, 36 seventeenths, and that's all she wrote. So 36 seventeenths. Again, if you wanted to go 2 and 2 seventeenths as a mixed number, that's fine, but you really don't have to write it as a mixed number unless they specifically tell you to. So this is okay. That's an improper fraction. It is reduced. This would lose you a point on the problem if you left it unreduced. All right, so voila, that's 11 and 12. Let's keep going. Uh, 13, the sum of two consecutive integers is negative 37. So when we talk about two consecutive integers, that's not the same. It's not the same number. It's got to be a number right next to a number. So consecutive integers are, that's a fancy way of saying numbers in a row. Oh, it, right in a row. Boom, boom, boom. So if I said three consecutive integers, that would be like 8, 9, 10. Those are three consecutive integers, 8 and then 9 and then 10. Now, if I think about that in terms of a variable, x, if that was x, this would be x plus 1, and this would be x plus 1 plus 1. So the three in a row would be x, x plus 1, and x plus 2. And then no matter what number I put, like if I did 90, it would be 90, 91, 92. It, that makes it three in a row, okay? And so that's what we have to do here. The sum, meaning add, 
the sum of two consecutive integers is negative 37. So we'll call our first integer x and our next integer x plus 1. And then sum means add. So x plus x plus 1, that's got to equal negative 37. So now forget about all the wording and everything. Just look at this as a standalone problem. Remember, there's a 1 in front of those x's. When we don't write anything there, there's a 1 there. So 1x one plus 1x one on the same side equal sign. We combine like terms. That's 2x plus 1. And then subtract, oh, subtract 1. How about... And then 2x is equal to negative 38, and then divide by 2. And then x is equal to negative 19. Now be careful. I've had students get this right, and then they still lose a point on it because they don't give me the correct other answer. Think about it. If it was um, negative 19, a bunch of students go, oh, and negative 20. Ah, you're going the wrong way. Look, we got um, negative 19 plus 1. That's not negative 20, that's negative 18. So our two consecutive integers are negative 19, negative 18. Because they're negative, it's kind of backwards of how we think about integers. You know, and then you can double check it, add those up. They're one right next to each other, just like 8, 9, 10, and they add up to negative uh, 37. So we're good. Let's look at 14. Solve this. Okay, so it's an absolute value problem with an equal sign. So that's an automatic or problem. And we're going to get two solutions, but they're just going to be new numbers, just numbers. All right, so first we want to isolate the absolute value. So we get W minus 4 is equal to negative 18. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hold up. When you take the absolute value, remember what absolute value is asking. It is asking the distance from zero on a number line. Distances can't be negative, ever. They can be zero. If it ended up being zero, it could be zero. So it doesn't have to be positive, but it can't be negative. So we could stop the show right here. This would just be no um, solution. And I think on uh, Newton, they wanted you to say... Um, w is equal to the empty set. That's the big circle with the line through it is called the empty set, meaning there isn't a, there's not a real solution we can put in there. Okay. If you didn't notice that and you worked it all out as um, W minus 4 equals negative 18, W minus 4 equals positive 18, both of the answers you got wouldn't have worked. You would get like 22, 22 minus 4 is 18, absolute value of 18 is 18 then it's not negative 18. It's never going to be negative. So make sure on those, if you're, you know, a little uh, unsure of those, uh, to check your answers. And then um, if they don't work out, it's no solution. All right, let's look at 15. Again, it's a little easier. It's more like um, 12 was. We got 2.1 times y minus 6 equals negative 0.3 y minus 12.6. And so, yeah, I, hmm, I'm not going to multiply everything by 10 to work with whole numbers. I don't mind working with decimals. Most students don't really have a problem with decimals. You get to use a calculator anyway. So... So I do the distributive property, and now I'm going to move the numbers over to one side. Now be careful on this one. Again, I, I see what is happening here. 2.1y is equal to negative 0.3y plus 0. So those zeroed out. That, that canceled there and there. So we got that. And so now a lot of students mess this up and say, oh, it's no solution. Uh-uh. It's... 2.4y equals 0. What you're thinking of with no solution would be if the variables disappeared. If this would have been 0y equals 15 or something, then it would be no solution. 
Um, this has a solution. I can divide both sides by 2.4. You can even run this in your calculator right now. Pop 0 divided by 2.4 in your calculator. And it will tell you 0. So it has a correct answer, 0. So if I put 0 back in to the original, it'll work out. Think about it. 0 minus 6 is negative 6 times that is negative 12.6. 0 times anything is 0, and that equals negative 12.6. So 0 works. All right? Okay. Let's get 16. 16 is Pythagorean's theorem. The Pythagoreans lived about um, 2,500 years ago. And they figured out that when you work with right triangles, right triangles, A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And then off of that, we have an entire branch of mathematics called trigonometry, right? Triangle trig, sines, cosines, and tangents, where we can use sides of a right triangle to always determine the angle and uh, and you know vice versa and so um but we're not learning that right now uh so this is 16 so we're just finding sides of a missing triangle so there is one important part about this c is the hypotenuse that's a fancy term for opposite the 90 degree angle the 90 degree angle is there and it's always going to be opposite. The opposite side of the 90 is called the hypotenuse. It's the longest side of any triangle. Think about it. If I had a triangle like an alligator mouth, rawr, rawr, rawr. look, the more, look at how little that is. See that distance? Bigger angle, bigger distance. Bigger angle still, bigger distance still. So this, the angle the size of the angle, the bigger the angle, the larger the distance across from it. There's another thing. All angles have to add up to be 180 degrees on any triangle. So if you have a 90 degree angle, the other two angles have to add up to be 90 degrees. And so that means if this one and this one have to add up to be 90, then this one is the big dog because both of those have to be less than 90 in order for them to add up to 90. And so that means if this one is the big dog, that side is the big side. And so that's why it, get, it gets a special name, the hypotenuse. All right. So now uh, we just plug and chug the numbers they give us. We're going to always work these one of two ways. Either you're going to square the numbers and subtract the numbers and then take the square root, or you're going to square the numbers and add the numbers and then take the square root. Because now look, we got 144 plus b squared is equal to 400. And now we isolate the variable. But we're not done. We got b squared is equal to um, 256. But I don't want b squared. I want b. I want b. So think about it. b times b is 256. So this is asking... What times itself gives you 256? Well, we have a symbol for that. That's the square root. Now, in reality, in algebra, when I have b squared equal to a number, there's actually two correct answers. There's a positive version and a negative version. So the two algebraically correct answers are plus or minus 16. But since we're talking about a length in a real life problem, the negative doesn't make sense. So there's, that's called a domain restriction, meaning if, if you start the problem and say, yeah, but your answer can't be negative, well, you've just restricted what's allowed for x, or in this case, b. So we throw away the negative, and b is equal to 16. All right. Let's get 17. Ooh, 17 is a distance one. Two buses lean... Billings at the same time. The Seattle bus heads west on I-90 at average of 70 miles per hour, while the Chicago bus heads east at average speed 68 miles per hour. How many hours will it take them to be 759 miles apart? Oh, okay. 
Okay, so the setup on this, it might help if we draw a picture. So now look, one's going due east, one's going due west. Um, never eat soggy weedy. So this one's going due east, eastbound. This one's going due west, westbound. And one of them's going a little bit faster. So we got distance equals rate times time, distance equals rate times time. But what's happening here is they, they want to know, um, they gave us a distance. They gave us the distance. But since one of them is going 70 miles, let's see, the Seattle bus is west. That's going 70 miles per hour. And this one is going 68 miles per hour. So now let's think about that. Miles per hour, miles per hour. That means each hour, one is getting 68 miles away and the other one is getting 70 miles away from where it started. So we could map this out as like a one hour, where were we? Two hours, where were we? Three hours, where were we? And we could just do it that way, but that's a pain. Don't do it that way. Let's use algebra and that'll be faster instead of like guessing and checking. So now think about this. If they're going away from each other at a, at a steady rate, we can combine those rates 70 plus 68. That means each hour, they are 138 miles apart each hour. So you combine them because they're opposing one another, okay? And so now it's just distance equals rate times time. So distance, they gave us the distance, 759 miles, and we have a rate, 138, and they want to know the time. So how much time would they have to be traveling away from each other at these average rates in order to get almost 760 miles away? Let me just divide. And you could just leave it as a decimal, 5.5 hours. If you made it five and a half hours, that's fine. This would be a case where we wouldn't want that as um, an improper fraction. That wouldn't make sense. They'd get you drug tested if you told them um, it was, what would that be, 15 halves hours? <laughs> it took 15 halves hours, five and a half hours, or 5.5 hours. All right? Okay. Um, 18 is super quick. We'll do 18. And then I think that'll be it for this video. And then I'll do another video for the last three pages. So 18 is negative 18, C is less than or equal to zero. Solve the inequality, write it as an interval, interval notation. So think about what we do, we divide both sides by negative 18. Again, it's not no solution, there's a solution. Zero divided by negative 18 works, that is zero. But because I'm dividing by a negative, that sign gets flip-flopped around. And now, for interval notation, if you're a little sketchy on it, you're like, I'm not quite sure how that works. What you're basically doing is you're giving me a line graph without actually drawing a picture. Look, this gets a bracket because it's a equal to, greater than or equal to sign. And then this states, if I read it out loud, C is greater than or equal to zero. Well, what is greater than zero? One is, and two is, and three is, and 3.1 is, and 3.99 is, and five is, and a million is. So we shade it to the right. Now, let's pretend like I hate pictures, like a calc teacher. And um, I want to know it's zero to positive infinity and a bracket on the zero. And infinity never, ever gets a bracket. It's always going to get a parenthesis. All right. And so this is interval notation. So it's a picture without drawing a picture. All right. Awesome. Next video will be the next uh, three pages of the test.